Edison. He, actually, Edison was the last first inventor of a light bulb. <laughs> okay? So um, what that means is, is that these progressions of technologies are inevitable. Okay? The, the, the progression of things in our of technological developments is like an evolutionary thing. They are inevitable. They were going to come anyway. Okay? It's inevitable that we'd have a telephone. The, the expression of that, the particular combination was not inevitable, but a telephone was inevitable. Okay? And the internet's inevitable. Human cloning is inevitable. The question is, what kind do we do? What kind of internet do we make? What kind of human cloning do we make? That's what the choice really comes down to. So, the web was inevitable, what kind do we have? So, I think, you know, when we have these technologies, they change our thinking. Alphabet was an invention, it led to linear thinking. The web is a different kind of thing. It's gonna to lead to a different kind of thinking. The pill encouraged feminism. Technology wants different things, okay? This is a robot. It's an autonomous robot um, in Willow Garage, and it plugs itself in. And I actually got to stand in between it and the plug. <laughs> because it searches around, it goes around looking for its own plug to plug in. And I can tell you, at that moment, it was very clear that that robot wanted <laughs> juice. You know, it was, it was, it was very, that, that want was not something I was projecting. It was very, very clear. And um, it doesn't have to be conscious, it's just that there are these tendencies. So the technology gives, and it gives us progress. I think part of my message is to really let us admit to ourselves that there is progress throughout history, that there is a, a, a developing betterment, that we have more choices than in the past, that, that we have um, more freedoms, that we have um, more possibilities. So um, these are all different curves, and generally if you curve any kind of living standards, they go up. They're all pointing up, okay? The number of years lived, the amount of education, you know, things like this. And so um, there, there, there is, over time, progress. And um, one of the things that we see is we see more of stuff. So um, if, if, if you, the average, um, the average household probably has around 6,000 or 10,000 species of different things. Actually, I counted all the ones in my house. Went with my daughter, I gave her a clicker. We were running around and said, how many different species of things do we have in our house? Where, you know, like two forks are basically two examples of, of one, you know, fork is a species. And so um, we found out there was around 6,000 or so, six to 8,000 different things in our household. And um, that was a species and maybe about 10,000 total objects. Uh, I looked at the inventory of King Henry VIII when he died. They did inventory of everything in his household, and they counted up 18,000 objects. That was the entire wealth of England. His household served as the treasury of England. So, so he had only a little bit, basically the entire wealth of England was only a little bit greater than the, than the things that we have in our households today. Okay. And um, in many ways, what's interesting is what Henry, King Henry VIII did not have, that his wealth could not buy, okay? He could not, all his wealth could not buy a tube of, of antibiotics, okay? He could not buy a comfortable journey of 100 miles. He could not buy refrigeration at any cost or a flush toilet. And so in many ways, that kind of rickshaw wallet in India who does live in a place that has running water, and he can buy a dollar's worth of antibiotics. He's actually richer than King Henry VIII was. In many, in most every way you can, you, you want to count. He'll live longer for it. And so um, that's what we get. Now the cost of technology is on the environment. We, everybody knows that. That's, that's very obvious, that there's, that there's some cost to that. And so the question is, are all the benefits that we're getting equal to the cost, or do they exceed the cost? And are we just going to keep going so we have this techno planet and there's no life left? And um, I think that's a real issue that people cons are concerned with. And, and one of the things that we are, are I think technology, as I said, ha have kind of a, has, a, has a progression, and I think has gone through a kind of a terrible two-toddler stage, where it was 
kind of very industrial and not very organic and um, not very sympathetic to, to us and selfish in some ways. And I think it's maturing. And so we can kind of, um, I think it's a little easier to, to imagine now, uh, there's almost no technology that we cannot see a greener version of. And as we make high-tech technology, one of the things we discover is that high-tech, to, 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 to make all these computer chips and things, requires incredibly clean water. So in a certain sense, technology wants clean water. It wants clean air. It wants, in many ways, the same thing that life wants. And um, we, we, we still have some choices, again, about the expression of that particular technology. And um, we can steer, I think, things towards a greener. So because life ex it came, because technology came out of life, it is not inherently antagonistic to life. It is compatible. In its inherent nature, technology is not contrary to living systems. It is a living system itself. And so we can always make things greener, and we should. I think technology loves biology. I don't think there are a hate relationship. I think they're actually it's compatible with it. And um, so it's still selfish, and it's generous at the same time. But we can, we can work with that dichotomy that's inside technology. What we don't want to do is use the precautionary principle, which says that we shouldn't use any technology until it's proven absolutely safe. That's one take on what we, the, the, the stance that we should have with new technology is that we should not use it unless it's absolutely proven to be safe. That's the precautionary principle. There's a certain aspect of that that makes sense, but I think it's actually the, the, the wrong thing to do. What we want to do, actually, is um, to actively engage with technology. This is what actually the Amish do. I talk about Amish hackers. The Amish are not anti-technologists at all. They're not Luddites. They actually love technology, and they try things out, and they have two criteria to decide whether they wanted to use it, and that is, does it make it easy to use uh, work at home? Does it bring their communities together? The reason why they rejected cars was not that they had anything against cars, but that they noticed that cars would make them drive away to shop out of the community or go to a park outside of their community. And if they had a horse and buggy, they could go, go only 15 miles, so they had to visit the, or the relatives or had to stay within the community, and therefore they used horse and buggy. But they're using cell phones because cell phones actually allow them to connect with their relatives in another state. Um, it's, it's something that is actually good. They use disposable diapers, they use rollerblades, they use genetically modified corn because all these things help them stay together. So the idea is that they engage with technology, try things out to see what effect it has on them. And that's what we want to do is we want to anticipate technology. We want to then constantly access it, try it out, see what happens, not just once but all the time. So I think we're going to change our idea about drugs. It used to be the drugs are past the FDA and then they're good. And then, then now there's a realization, well, we should test them every couple of years because the formulations change, people's reactions, how they use change them. And so there's this idea of constantly going back and checking with yourself, I'm using this, is this giving me what I want? Yeah, I've been using a car for 30 years, but do I still want to use a car? So this constantly ass assessing things. And then we prioritize the risks, meaning that Lots of times we have a bias when something comes new, we want to test that, prove that that works, but there's no sense that we have to actually prove that the old thing doesn't have, um, you know, I guess harm, is doing harm. So, so we give the old things kind of a, a pass. And oftentimes the old things are just as bad as the new things, but they don't, aren't, we don't require to test them. So there's, we have to kind of not penalize just the new things if we're going to really test things. And we really should be very good at um, restituting when the harm is done. We should be realistic about technologies as they come in. I think of this last thing as relocation. What we want to really do with new technologies is find them the right home. Okay, find them the right job. So DDT, that was a technology that um, we started to use to spray on crops and cotton, huge volumes, millions of pounds. to. And it was terrible. It was it, this cause. This was the you know impetus for the Silent Spring and the environmental movement. The harm that it caused was huge. But actually, it turns out that DDT used locally, sprayed in a household, 
is actually the best thing for malarial um, elimination. So you want to find the right place for this technology. It's actually really good. It doesn't cause harm. It causes incredible good. It saves millions of lives a year. And that is a good use for it. It's not good to be used on spraying uh, agricultural pesticides. So we want to find the right home for technologies. You know, nuclear power might be another example of that. So there it is. Nuclear power, okay, we'll find, you know, using it for bombs is totally, 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 cuts down options. It's not a good use of it. But for uh, generating electricity, uh, nuclear power in a submarine or something, it's, it's ideal. So we want to find the right jobs. And I think of technologies as sort of like ideas. So if somebody has a bad idea, what's, your, what's the response to a bad idea? Well, the response to a bad idea is, is, is not to like, stop thinking, don't think. No, the response to a bad idea is a, uh, a better idea. Okay? So the response to a bad technology is not to have um, stop technology, is to actually have better technologies. Because actually in some ways, uh, technology is just a type of an idea that we make real. So, so what I'm suggesting is that um, if we have bad um, technologies, then what we want to do is we want to um, make better ones. So, so, the, so normally the response to something that doesn't work is not to, to say, well, we need less, less technology in our lives. It's to say, no, no, we need better technology in our lives. And I think that's a, a very profound stance to take because we become sort of like parents to these mind children. We, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to find the best home, the best idea, the best place for a, a technology. When we have an idea, we want to find a good place for that idea. It may not be in, as an agricultural pesticide, it may want to be used in a localized spring for malaria. Uh, 